All right, here we are for part five of this series, still talking about the cohomology of Island Bear McLean spaces, though I believe this will be the last uh, video in, in this uh, story. So our goal is to prove this theorem of Serre that we saw in the last video, that we know the cohomology of Kz mod 2n in mod 2 coefficients completely, so not just up to degree 2n, it should be isomorphic to uh, polynomial algebra on square i iota n, where as before, i runs through all admissible sequences, non ademable things, um, with excess less than n. Notice, by the way, the lowest degree thing here, iota n, has degree n, right? So we're only going to start to see that polynomial stuff come into play when we get to iota n squared. That'll be our first product. And so Indeed, this does just look like um, the squares, some of the squares at least, the ones that have excess less than n, um, on iota n up to degree 2n. And then it's at degree 2n where things start to, to get funky and we see these products. Okay, so let's prove this. And we've basically done most of the work at this point. So what we want to do is induct on n. Our base case is trivial as usual, so I'm going to look at the cohomology of kz mod 2 1 in mod 2 coefficients. That's our rp infinity. We really checked this already as our sanity check. So this is polynomial on iota 1. That's the stuff with excess less than uh, 1 and the excess 0. Yep, that's all good. Okay, so now we want to assume uh, for our inductive hypothesis that the cohomology of kz mod 2n is just going to be polynomial on these square i's. Maybe let me not write out the whole sentence. Uh, but these are I admissible, and we want to run over all of those sequences where the excess is less than n. And what do we want to do? Well, our best technique for this induction is going to be to use our loop path vibration. So we'll use that we know the cohomology of Kz mod 2n. The paths are contractible over the base Kz struggling to write kz mod 2 n plus 1 and we'll use the Serre spectral sequence as usual. Okay, let me scroll up a little here, getting crowded at the bottom. Okay, so um, notice that the cohomology of our fiber, this kz mod 2 n in uh, some fields, specifically z mod 2, has a simple system of generators. Well, I think I've scrolled too far. Okay, so this is polynomial, right? And we saw that a polynomial algebra, we can write down easily a simple system of generators. We just take uh, each of our polynomial generators and then to powers of two. So uh, awkwardly over this page break here, I should take each square i iota n where i is admissible and has excess less than n and then I should take that and raise it to powers of two. So this is really for various k and i, where I make sure that the excess of i is less than n. Okay, and from our lemma, 
we saw that if you have these admissible sequences with excess less than n and you write them uh, to powers of 2, well, then this is the same as squares with a different sequence, j, on iota n, where the excess of j is less than or equal to n. Well, actually, our lemma went exactly backwards, right? So we said, sure, you could take things that are excess less than n, that's fine, um, but when you get to excess equals n, then you can take this uh, kind of thing and rewrite it as something like this. Okay, so we're using that lemma backwards, I suppose. Um, now, what's key here is that iota n is transgressive. We've seen this a bunch of times, but I'll draw the picture again. But remember the squares commute with the transgression, so squared j iota n is transgressive. Okay? Um, oh, and maybe I should have said, why do I not need uh, things that are even bigger? Well, we already know that squares with excess greater than n kill this thing. So, so that really is all we need. Okay, let me draw this usual picture again, sort of very briefly. So I'm drawing the E2 page of my serospectral sequence. It's kind of all of the pages at once. My fiber is kz mod 2 n, and then my base is kz mod 2 n plus 1. Okay, so I've got uh, like this iota n here in degree n. And then remember, it looks like the Steenrod algebra on this for a while. Didn't come out very well. Okay, and then I've got this class here, iota n plus 1. And iota n transgresses to iota n plus 1. There's nowhere else for it to die, and this all has to die at the end. So that's my transgression. And then that tells me that I actually have the Steenrod algebra so we're starting on these classes, and so on. Okay, and uh, well, by Borel's theorem, we know that since the cohomology of the fiber uh, is a simple system of transgressive generators, we just checked that these things are transgressive, then the cohomology of the base should be polynomial in the transgression applied to this. And our base here, remember, is just uh, kz mod 2 n plus 1 for our inductive step. OK, so by Borel's theorem, this is polynomial in the transgression applied to the square j's, I guess I called it. j and i got sort of swapped from my lemma. Um, but what is that? That's square j applied to tau iota n, and that's square j iota n plus 1. Okay, and now we just have to check in with our j's. Well, j has to be admissible. with excess less than or equal to n. That's what we learned right up here from our lemma. Okay, and that completes the proof. So as I said, we've really done all of the work up front here and it's just putting it all together. But maybe let me point out sort of a neat fact we get from this, which I've said before, but maybe we didn't know why. So an immediate corollary is that square i where i is admissible is a basis for the Steenrod algebra. Now I said this back when we were just talking about properties of the Steenrod algebra, but remember that the cohomology of our island bird mclean spaces, when we take that inverse limit as n grows larger and larger, we get the Steenrod algebra. And so as n gets larger and larger, we have no restriction on the excess but we still need these i's to be admissible to get the basis, and so that, that proves this corollary. Okay, uh, so that really concludes the, the bulk of what I want to say, but 
let me sort of wrap this up with a few more related facts that, that we can learn and that will turn out to be useful for us. So in essentially the same way, with some minor adjustments, and I won't go through the details of that, I'll leave it to you, but we can prove another theorem of Sayers. Sayer computed the cohomology of the eilenberg maclean spaces Kzn in mod 2 coefficient mod 2 coefficients, again in much the same way, so let me emphasize this is a z here, that's not an accident. And uh, again, this is going to be polynomial in some square i's on iota n, and what are the i's? Well now uh, i runs over admissibles, again with excess less than n. Okay, that would be sort of shocking if I stopped there because that would be saying that this cohomology is the same as kz mod 2n, so that, that seems unlikely. So let me add another restriction. This i does not end in 1. So, for example, square 2, square 1, it's not one of the things I should include. And where is this uh, second piece coming from? This is really just because in this setting, square 1 iota n is 0. Okay, I said I'd leave most of the adjustment to you, but maybe let's look through an example just to see how that's showing up. So, for example, let's think about kz2 which we could take to be CP infinity, or we could just compute its cohomology uh, directly. I think we've already done this as an exercise. So actually, maybe we did this even in a video. Can't remember. Okay, so we just get polynomial on a class in degree two. Really, this comes from starting with kz1, which we know is a circle, and, and bootstrapping our way up. Okay, and so now if we look in mod 2 coefficients, again, still kz2, but just changing the coefficients, then same thing, but polynomials over z mod 2. Okay, and by abuse, I'm calling both of these generators iota2, the fundamental class, sort of the obvious thing. Um, this makes sense, by the way, from the universal coefficient theorem. So we saw the universal coefficient theorem already going from homology to cohomology, but uh, I've already really been referring to the one that goes from homology to homology or cohomology to cohomology, but let me write it out. So I just tensor with my new coefficients, where um, I'm leaving off the integral coefficients here, and then Instead of x, there's a Tor term, just because this is the derived functor of tensor. And now I have to look in the m plus first cohomology, um, because I'm doing this for cohomology. OK, so uh, that at least convinces you that there isn't going to be any new interesting stuff in any other degrees, because our cohomology and integral coefficients was free, so no Tor terms. OK. Uh, now, again, what's our standard game? We'll take the space we know, stick it in our loop path vibration, and learn about the base, kz3, and use the Sayre spectral sequence. Okay, and I again, I won't go too deeply into this, but that got a little wonky. Probably not going to be much better. Okay, uh, let's let's just at least get this started. So I always like to remind myself: cohomology of the fiber goes over here, cohomology of the base goes over here. Okay, I've got. Um, I'm going to draw it right on the axis here because 
I don't need a lot of room. So that's really just uh, sort of one tensor one in degree zero, zero. Then over here, I'm gonna draw uh, this polynomial thing. So there was a zero. Um, you know what, maybe let me not write zero. I think that's kind of confusing. I'm just trying to draw these polynomial generators. So I want iota two, I suppose. Iota two squared, iota two cubed, that's supposed to say, and so on, right? Uh, maybe let me just say in degree one, that's zero. So let me squiggle it out. True in any odd degree. I might turn this into a mess, so I might regret that, but we'll see. Um, okay, then I've got uh, nothing here or here because my base is two connected. So again, I've got squiggles through all above that. And then I've got this fundamental class, iota three in degree three. And as usual, this transgresses. Uh, maybe I should start using different colors now. See if I can just change that to green, say. Okay, um, so this transgresses. And then I know that square two on this class is going to transgress to square two on this. So I must have square two iota three. And I should have like tensor products. So there's i2 tensor or sorry, iota 2 tensor iota 3 and I uh, just by writing down that transgression which was a d3 differential I suppose then I'll see that iota 3 goes to or sorry this tensor product put this a little closer this tensor product uh, it's going to have a d3 supported there and then I look at uh, this degree between iota three and square two iota three. Not that you can tell that's what the label was supposed to go to. Um, no, maybe that's confusing to you. Okay, maybe let me change the color. Not sure that will work. Ah, lovely. Okay. Um, so Oh, what was that? I guess that's got to be iota three squared was the whole point of that story. Uh, but what, what am I trying to say? I always get lost when I start telling you guys about these pictures. I keep wanting to say it out of order. I, I want to look at this spot and I look backwards and of course it can't be hit by a D1. That thing uh, lives to the D3 page or E3 page. It can't be hit by something here, which is zero. Here I have zero. Here I have zero. And so uh, there's, there can't be anything here because there would be no witness to kill it. Okay, so actually I learned that, um, maybe let me put that here, that this has to be a zero. Okay, and so there's just no room for a square one. Okay, maybe I haven't proved that to you in full generality, but uh, they're the same kind of argument. We'll show you that, that there's no room for a square one in these settings. Okay, uh, as long as we're here, and again, since we'll need it, let's say a little bit more. So again, along the same vein, using the same kind of proof techniques, Sarah proved yet another result, which is that for k greater than one, we actually know the cohomology of our eilenberg maclean spaces that look like z mod two to the k comma n, again in mod two coefficients. So far, all of this has been in mod two coefficients. Um, and what do you get? Well, it, again, looks like polynomial on some squares on our fundamental class, iota n. And we just need to figure out what the restrictions are on this i. This keeps jumping around on me, sorry. 
probably needs to restart. I think it's been on too long. Okay, so where I runs over, well, it's gonna start out much the same, so admissibles. with excess less than n. And furthermore, well, last time we saw something funny if i ends in one, their square one was just zero, so that was already zero. We shouldn't include it in our list. And again, if i ends in one, we should be careful. So I'm thinking of, uh, this i is being i1 up to ir, and so I'm talking about ir being one, then replace square ir, or really square one, with beta k. And now beta k here is the box sign, which we've met before. Well, we've met several box signs, so um, this is given by the connecting homomorphism. For, well, associated to the short exact sequence where we include Z mod two into z mod two to the k, sorry, k plus one, and quotient to z mod two to the k. So remember uh, when we had z mod four in the middle, that was our, our usual first beta that was our d1 in the box time spectral sequence. Um, and so what do we get here? Well, we don't have square one on iota n, but we have things like square two iota n. We've got things like square four, square two iota n, We've got things like square four, square two, and then I want to write square one, but I replace it with a beta k, iota n, and so on. Okay, lots of, lots of things. Um, and, and maybe let me finish this long five-part story by saying uh, that this, this came up in discussion, you can use the Bockstein spectral sequence from this data to find uh, the cohomology now of k z mod 2 n in integral coefficients. So now I'm changing the coefficients. And if you're interested in that, um, you'd want to look at uh, theorem 10.4 in May's, Peter May's, not mine. Uh, paper, a general approach, can't spell anymore, a general approach to Steenrod operations. Um, or maybe start to do the computation some yourself. This could be a good uh, option for a project if you're still looking around for one. Okay, so this completes uh, at least the bulk of what I want to say about the cohomology of island bird mclean spaces. Now remember, the reason we went through all of this toil and trouble was so that we could start to compute homotopy groups of spheres, and we'll see that all of this ends up playing a role there. So that'll, again, take us some work to get there, but, but we've now set a good foundation. Okay, let me stop there.